What up? All right, so today we're gonna to talk about the relationship between anesthetics and ORC-OR. Some people have been bringing up the question about how do things like ketamine work in the brain, and there's this misconception, I think, that ketamine works on NMDA receptors and glutamate and all kinds of complex things. But if you look into the ORC-OR model of consciousness, and you get a better sense for these quantum qubit states within microtubules, you can get a better understanding of what is the relationship between how ketamine acts on consciousness and then anesthetics act on consciousness, and furthermore, how psychedelics also act on consciousness. And what you'll see in today's video is that there's a common mechanism whereby this is happening. If you've seen my last video on kind of the introduction to orc -OR, you'll have a bit of a primer where we talk about quantum states happening within benzene rings. So let's go to the board and just recap a little bit. So first thing we have here is, obviously we have the famous microtubule, part of the cytoskeleton commonly found in your pyramidal neurons inside of your prefrontal cortex and cortical level five. So inside of the microtubules, you have a... Uh, uh, dipole, a, oh, sorry, a tubulin um, dimer right here. And inside of the tubulin dimer, you have benzene rings represented as a, as a hexagonal shape. Um, then you have these uh, dipole oscillations. These are essentially free-flowing carbon um, arms that are flowing back and forth, and they kind of carry a certain like directionality to them in any one time. Given their uh, given their location inside of the microtubule, they're insulated enough where it's not wet and it's not noisy uh, and it's not too warm for there to be quantum uh, states still inside of these benzene rings. That's a big uh, level of contention with orc -war. People say it's too warm, wet, and noisy for these to maintain any kind of a quantum superposition, but uh, some of the research shows that it is actually possible um, and that they can maintain uh, this state because they're uh, non-polar hydrophobic areas of the brain uh, in these areas. So it's possible, actually. So let's take something like nitrous oxide. So as you can see here, yeah, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide's very simple. I think it was one of the first anesthetic gases that was ever manufactured. It was produced gosh, 200 something years ago at this point in time. So how does it work? Well, it has uh, obviously two uh, nitrogen atoms connected to an oxygen and its effects, whatever they may be, and they're kind of a pi resonance ring, um, can jut up so close to a benzene ring inside of the microtubule. And we really know that, that anesthetics are acting very close into microtubules and they're not acting to block synaptic activity uh, in, in a neuron model. So you can't think of a neuron as this cartoon thing where anesthetics go into the synapses and block activity because um, anesthetics only act in certain areas and they have certain effects and they're not always the same all the time. So there's some nuances to anesthetics that do point to the orc -OR model being more accurate as a framework for understanding how anesthesia works. So for instance, nitrous oxide can jut up against the benzene ring, and typically uh, a coherent benzene ring, a, 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 an aromatic ring within, within a phenylalanine or tryptophan within the amino acid sequence of a microtubule, of a tubulin dimer, um, is usually rec represented with some kind of a polarity with a one or the other direction, right? Typically like this, this and this. You see those three lines there. However, when you get something like nitric oxide uh, put up against it, you also interfere with the London dipole forces or the van der Waals forces. And at a distance, two uh, aromatic rings that get too close or get close enough, uh, within I think it's a few angstroms of each other or something like that, um, can interfere and have basically interaction at a distance. They don't even have to be touching but the, um, the, the dipole oscillations within the benzene rings starts to flicker in sequence according to what's closest to it. That's why these microtubules are so kind of 
stacked. They have these pi stacks, is what they're called. So if you put nitrous oxide, you actually are able to interfere with van der Waals forces, and you basically get some form of distortion. You can knock off, you knock out the synchronicity of microtubules as they oscillate throughout the brain. That's why something like anesthesia can at first cause even some psychedelic type effects, some hallucinatory uh, altered states of consciousness. But the more you increase the uh, alveolar concentration, the, I think it's called the MAC, the MAC, you basically get to a point where uh, you saturate these regions, uh, these non-polar regions in the microtubule, and you can knock out all ability for a microtubule in the pyramidal neurons to maintain a coherent oscillata oscillatory state, which would manifest as consciousness. Now, some, some know, and nitrous oxide used to be very commonly used as an anesthetic gas, not so much anymore in a hospital room, simply because it's highly flammable. It's actually a big risk to use in an operating theater. So nitrous oxide interferes with this. There are other things that interfere with it. Uh, xenon, for instance, which is a, uh, a stable, noble gas, uh, can also similarly cause uh, very interesting effects um, at very low alveolar concentrations. Xenon gas is extremely expensive. However, it's very rare, so don't expect to go out and be able to buy any of it and try it. Um, don't try any of this, by the way. I'm not recommending any of this stuff. I'm just sharing this as information so you can make informed decisions. Now, a lot of people today are turning to things like ketamine. Ketamine is a disassociative uh, compound, essentially. It's a, it's a molecule. This is what it looks like right here. This is the, the chemical, uh, uh, basically, con uh, formula for uh, ketamine. Now, uh, what do you notice about ketamine that's distinct? What you'll see here is that in this particular case, there is a benzene ring and also another benzene ring. So there's a, uh, there are two benzene rings oriented in relationship to each other. Ketamine can get very close up to these uh, benzene rings within the mi microtubules and also cause a decoherence of the ability for your microtubules to maintain a coherent oscillatory state. They get they bump so close up to it that they start to interfere with that almost a windshield wiper effect within these uh, uh, within the carbon benzene rings, okay? So ketamine has that unique feature very similar to nitrous oxide. Now ketamine is at low doses slightly hallucinogenic at higher doses can cause almost complete disassociation and at a high enough dosage as with any of these chemicals, well, maybe not theobromine of chocolate, I, I don't really know uh, what the maximum dosage of, of it is, but will cause a loss of consciousness or a, you know, basically a disassociated state where you're no longer conscious. So they have those similarities, okay? Now, if you simply go to Google and you type in what is the chemical formulation of lysergic acid or dimethyltryptamine or any other psychedelic that's commonly used, psilocybin, you'll always understand or you'll always notice this core common benzene ring pattern in all of those psychoactive chemicals. Not every molecule that you put into your body is going to have a psychoactive effect. So what is the similarity between them? If we know that if we put one benzene ring close enough to another benzene ring, that you can influence the two of them next to each other. Okay, so your microtubules are so closely stacked with all, the, uh, all of their benzene rings that if you have oscillations here, it basically oscillates and travels down in a, in a sort of a pie stack uh, fashion, okay? So ketamine does it. Chocolate apparently has the same uh, chemical composition. So if you look at chocolate, theo, uh, the active chemical in chocolate, theobromine, um, has been said to have some mind-altering effects. Now, what do you notice about this one? You have a uh, aromatic, uh, aromatic ring. 
you have a benzene ring, and then you also have uh, another, uh, an addition that would generally cause and influence the effect that this would have on a microtubule in the same way. So, so look it up. I highly encourage you, go look up uh, any, any chemical that you can take that has somewhat of a modification of consciousness and you will notice some very interesting similarities. Now, you might be wondering, well, nitrous oxide doesn't have that, but nitrous oxide is so small that it can penetrate so deeply and it can still have those effects. This can still act so close to these benzene rings that it can still have a mind-altering effect. That's the point here, is that anything that can exert and go deep enough into a microtubule, which is a deep protein structure deep into a neuron, um, if you can penetrate that far and affect these benzene rings, you have the ability to alter consciousness. So what do you do with that information? Well, you, you basically go, well, there's a lots of paths you could take. One that my mind wants to go to is what would it look like in the future of developing new drugs, new compounds, um, discovering new drugs that we could formulate or synthesize? Could you create a specific type of experience? Could you map an experience based on maybe creating an analog of ketamine that was just slightly different and almost doing a simulation or a prediction of when this shape gets close to this in the microtubule, it affects the frequency of the oscillations within the microtubule and all the way down to what we perceive as consciousness, however altered that may be. What if you changed, I don't know, added some kind of a chlorine or, or something? I mean, you could make some modification to this. There are analogs to ketamine. There are many. I, I'm certainly not claiming to be a chemist here. I'm not going to on the fly make analogs of these drugs, right? I'm not, I'm not Shulgin, right? But uh, that's how Orcawar can help inform uh, some pretty re revolutionary modifications and analog discovery of new drugs, new compounds that could still have the desired effect, but have maybe less of the side effects if we understand what is the main, what's the main point, right? If the main point of ketamine is to create some kind of a harmonic lock within a microtubule to give people some kind of a, a wow state, could you do that with something that also doesn't destroy your bladder? okay, or eats away at your kidneys or whatever, right? We all know that ketamine has some pretty serious side effects with long-term high dosage use. So the, the, the modifications to consciousness, let's keep those, let's get rid of the extra stuff that we might not need. Um, so you'll find similarities between all major psychedelics, uh, uh, pharmacological agents that modify consciousness that change your conscious perception, which microtubules are your ability to objectively reduce the quantum waveform within your brain. You basically have a quantum observing uh, system, and anytime you put something in there um, like this, like this, you can modify that. Maybe, maybe chocolate, for instance, can make you see the world in a different way, fundamentally. Wouldn't that be interesting? In the same way that taking a heroic dose of of magic mushrooms could also change your perception of reality. So I find that to be all very fascinating. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, thanks so much for watching and um, who knows what the next topic will be on this, but just kind of free form stuff here. Thanks guys so much for watching and keep the comments coming. Let me know what you, <laughs> let me know what you have to share. I've loved watching some of the comments. Somebody, I have to share this, somebody said, um, Oh, I was totally on board with the quantum consciousness and microtubules, but I saw some of your other videos on the vagus nerve and I was like, wow, this is a bunch of bullshit. Like, like vagus nerve is woo woo and, uh, and quantum consciousness is some like, oh yeah, this is like, yeah, this is, this is non-controversial stuff. I thought that was very funny. So I love that comment. I understand that it could be sarcastic. Okay. I'm not that, I'm not that much of a rube, but it was very funny. So. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoy these videos. I, I definitely enjoy making them. Um, so keep the likes coming. Subscribe if you want to see more. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.